Digital Tech Fed. I'm Nicole Avila, and I am joined today by Daniela Pires, head of the USA 5G Smart Factory, Carlos Torres, our head of industry for Auto, and Paul Tess, one of our 5G solution architects. We have an exciting agenda today. We're going to deep dive on industry 4.0 and 5G connectivity in manufacturing, and we will have a lot of time to hear from you and answer questions. So please post your questions and your comments to the chat. We'll address those later in this presentation. To start off, though, I want to introduce our factory. So Daniela, can you tell us what is the USA 5G Smart Factory and why are we here? Sure. I think that it's a, first of all, welcome everybody to our US 5G Smart Factory. It's a great moment for us to be here with our expert to talking about 5G and 4G you know, and the Indus 4.0. So for us to start talking about a factory, if we move to you know the, the slides that I think that it's good for the audience to see that as well. So why we are here? So first of all, we wanted to bring as Ericsson, we want to connect to the North America. So the US uh, market is very, very important for all of us here. And the Ericsson acknowledged that. And then we decided you know, to according to the strategy to be here in the US to deliver and be close to our customers. So that it's very important. And we cannot forget that we are producing the 5G products <clears throat> to deliver it to our customer here. So we are accelerating the 5G network for this country. And when we're talking about transformation, that it's a great point for us to be sure that we are addressing this in this factory because Together with the 5G and also the Indus 4.0, we are seeing a path for us to grow and bring the technology and improve in many parts of uh, our responsibility here. When we talk about safety, when we talk about efficiency, how can we bring more efficiency for our manufacturing? So that it's very important for us to keep in mind that we are leading the transformation also inside the Ericsson and we are part of this journey. When we talk again uh, about exploring what we have available for us, the Smart Factory has a key role and responsibility inside Ericsson to show that. And the third part here that I want to bring it to our attention is securing the supply chain. So uh, it's very, very, very important when we're talking about global footprint. So Ericsson decided, and it's part of the strategy again, I, I want to mention many times about the strategy because this is totally connected to be close to our customers. So Ericsson is demonstrated that it is market, it's important, but also when we're talking about sustainability, we are bringing, you know, instead of flying products or finished goods, we are here to produce and deliver it to our customers. So less CO2 emission. And then when we talk about sustainability, because I mentioned that sustainability, it's part of our responsibility as well. And Ericsson has, you know, uh, the main the main reason that we are talking sustainability right now is that we designed this this building you know to include sustainability in all features when we uh, talking about energy so we are using our solar solar panels to generate energy to our building and also we are we can consider that we are 100 percent energy renewable we are using that uh, when we talk about water, so the, the, the building that we have here, we are consuming 75% less uh, water compared to the other buildings. So as you see in this, in this picture, the chillers that we have, we have 40,000 gallons that we are, you know, reusing our water and then uh, we frozen and then we can use it to cool down our building during the day. So the, we are using less energy in our offices when we turn on our uh, air conditioning. And then when we talk about Indus 4.0, we are part of the revolution of Indus 4.0. Ericsson is driving that. It's very important to keep this in mind. 
So when we're talking about 5G or internet, everything, IoT, the platform, data, we are in this moment right now. So we need to collect the data, you know, for us to act very fast in order to improve our performance. And also when we talk about safety, not uh, we are talking about safety in our daily operations, but it's very important for this factory to be, you know, uh, leading the, the safety part. Uh, what else we can talk about Indus 4.0? This, this factory is considered a highly automated factory. So we are using, you know, AMR, so the autonomous mobile robots to, to run, a, a, to make the material movement here in the factory. And I'm sure that we have the experts here to tell more about what we are driving in our Indus 4.0. Okay. Thank you, Daniela. Of course. So one thing you mentioned a lot was Industry 4.0. And as you saw in the video, this factory is actually an Industry 4.0 lighthouse based on the World Economic Forum. Oh, yeah. So we have Carlos with us, our head of Industry 4.0. And Carlos, I would like to hear from you. How are we thinking about Industry 4.0 here? Industry 4.0 is absolutely transformative. It might be a word we hear a lot today. And with transformations, there's, there's more than just technology. There are smart people enabling and leveraging this technology to do really cool things. There is a transformation with the people that are become the end users of the technology and how they think and how they think about interacting with their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, a lot of industry 4.0 is the people aspect, what really cool things they can do with the technology and how it impacts the world around them. We deliver innovative manufacturing solutions that help us consistently meet our customer expectations. We relentlessly chase production uh, capacity and efficiency while in parallel driving for um, these adoption of cellular technologies. Um, there's a lot of focus in scaling these technologies. We spend a lot of time um, relentlessly pushing and knocking down organizational silos that enable us to deliver these solutions quickly. So at scale is a very, very important topic. Anything that we're talking about doing here, we're talking about doing at all of the Ericsson sites. Um, and that is a lot of fun. Um, we get to leverage cool technologies, uh, IIoT sensors, we get to leverage machine learning AI, we get to leverage cloud, we get to leverage the data and the analytics. Um, and then like all transformations, ending on that, uh, the transformative part, the change management that comes with Industry 4.0. These are all topics um, that are a part of our day-to-day -day lives. We spend a lot of time at this factory um, talking about them and hoping that the audience can learn some things. Thank you. So one thing you touched on was cellular technology and how we're implementing that. So here we're not just having the products, the 5G radios, the baseband, mm -hmm roll off our lines, but we're looking at how we can use those kinds of technologies in manufacturing. So Paul, can you tell us a little bit about what cellular technologies we're using here at the Smart Factory? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. So what's really cool is we're actually using some of the products we make here at the factory to provide a 5G private network in the factory. So let me define what a private network is. So we all have our cell phones and that's connected through the macro network. And because we have so many machines that we want to connect up through uh, with data into Industry 4.0, we wanted a private network that keeps all of the data in-house, on-premises, but also avoids the subscription costs of all these devices sending so much data. So we have two private networks in this factory, one which uses unlicensed spectrum, CBRS, and that's very analogous to, let's say, Wi-Fi, but it uses cellular technology, so there's more robustness, security, and reliability from the RF. Um, we have another private network which uses license spectrum, and that's millimeter wave. And that gives us a lot more bandwidth, but it's newer, so there are fewer devices. So I think we benefit from having both, and we've connected up our building management system, all of our AMRs, and we've done a lot of experiments to show the benefit of that. But the key thing is I think we've made it simpler for customers to buy it. We have an Ericsson private 5G network that is really similar to how an IT operation can run Wi-Fi. So then um, to adopt cellular is not a big lift for uh, organizations like ours. So why is cellular technology something that we're looking into? Why is it something we see value in? The, the, I was sold at the improved reliability aspect. 
Um, and I think that's something that a lot of manufacturers are, are, are challenged with. And then you throw in the, the, the benefits on the latency side, the bandwidth side, and that's just, just icing on a cupcake uh, for me. So there, there's a lot out there. And then um, we're expecting to see reduced total cost of ownership, so high benefit. Um, how that impacts our operations, um, any time we have a production stop, it's, it's an efficiency loss and, and it affects our, our utilization numbers. Um, and then there is a lot of supporting processes that enable us to get back up and running as quickly as possible. So uh, always, always uh, pushing to, to minimize any production loss events. And I see this as a technology that helps us get there. Yeah, I think the reliability is a given, right? Cellular is much more robust than Wi-Fi. Um, and you know, while Wi-Fi works well, there are many examples where we've run into problems, especially when there's a lot of devices connecting, mm -hmm. right? You run into capacity issues. So that's a fundamental thing. But what's also cool is we're actually, cellular evolves constantly and you're getting new features. So network slicing and ultra reliable mm -hmm. low latency, let us talk to our vendors and come up with new things. So we're imagining the possible in the future and we're saying, look, we've got this network, make better use of it, right? So we can come up with really, really cool ideas that come in the future. So we do have a story about where we've seen some of the benefit and the potential with material movement. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, one of the first things we started with is uh, our autonomous mobile robots. It's kind of obvious that these things move around, and whenever they get into a coverage uh, gap in, in Wi-Fi, they, they stop and we have to send someone out there. And so just fundamentally connecting them over 5G. So we initially um, worked the, with the vendor and then just added a modem to it because they don't come with 5G as an option. But the connection improved the reliability so much, the vendor actually worked with us, the AMR vendor um, worked with us to say, well, what can we do with that improved connectivity, right? So now we have things like map sharing, sensor sharing, and that reduces our uh, maintenance costs uh, for these things. So you don't have to remap the factory. They're more efficient in how they move. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of shows, like, once you've improved the connectivity and you give your partners more bandwidth, more capability, they can do a lot of things with it. And then you can dream up new use cases, mm -hmm. which we're really doing. It's, it's a lot of fun and exciting to come up with all these things. I think if I can, just, I can yeah. add about the material movement, it's very important. We yeah. see, you know, the game, but uh, you can have the, the components around it, but also about quality that it's very important when we have the AMRs, you know, supporting us and, and mm -hmm. pick, we put the components, but then now we are uh, less handling the components. So right. for the machines, I believe that it's very important for us to highlight exactly. that. Exactly. So, yeah, we make a lot of use of uh, autonomous mobile robots to move materials around. It helps reduce the number of people mm -hmm. doing things like that, but it also improves safety as well as the quality, like you mentioned. Yeah. So, I think that's actually really uh, important as part of our automation. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So one thing that we do talk about sometimes, though, is that this has been a journey. Mm -hmm. Industry 4.0 yeah. is a journey. 5G implementation is a journey. So what are some of the lessons we've learned along the way? This is absolutely a journey, and mm -hmm. it's not a use case. A use case implies there, there's a start, and then there's an end, or a couple of use cases. The impact to an organization is is broad and it affects your people your processes and your technology and they all need to be looked at together so the right strategy um, when you when you start looking at this the right vendors and partnerships that you're using um, what platforms are going to use uh, uh, you, you need to start thinking about your connectivity in the same conversations as your cloud and your machine learning and your ai and and that that is uh breaking a mold breaking out of a mental model because all these things are connected on the floor to, to, the, to, the, to the people that are out on the floor every day. Um, they just want it to be handled, right? And one thing impacts another. Um, so I would absolutely think about these conversations in context of the broader so that we're not creating organizational silos where other decisions are impacting the perceived benefits that you could get from these technologies. That was a huge lesson for us that I'm happy to share with, with everybody. Um, but I think, you know, as a journey, right, using that metaphor, um, the path changes. So we planned for a huge automation and then we introduced new products. So we have to adapt. And I think that's one of the benefits of having something like 5G and also being ready to innovate is when, when something forces you to adapt, 
you're much more agile because you don't have to re cable. You can experiment more. Um, and we found that uh, you know sometimes you come up with a great idea or it seemed great, and then we pivot because it wasn't so great. It can't scale or you can't integrate it. So I think you know one advice would be just to uh, not be too stuck and rigid in your plan because things will change. Technology changes. COVID happened, and so you know those kind of things um, show the the importance of agility. Industry 4.0, right? It's all about reacting quickly to changes in information, right? So. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that that was a, a big learning too, is to be really, really agile. And I think that it's connected with the inno innovation. You know, we're talking yeah. about Industry 4.0, but then uh, it's a journey together with the innovation, and we need to have the time, you know, to experiment. Yeah, and the team here is great because you know, with, with the with the team we get to work with, everyone's innovating, everyone's super excited about technology, mm -hmm. and even. Every floor worker has the opportunity to come up with brilliant ideas, and it's super encouraging to see. Yeah. Innovation, that's really a big theme Absolutely. for this. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we'll open up for questions soon. I see some coming in the chat, so please keep those coming. We do want to address your questions and your comments. Before we get to that, though, we've touched on this a little, but what advice would you have for organizations that are maybe looking into implementing something like 5G? What should they be thinking about and considering? Well, I think, you know, Carlos and I talk about this a lot, right? So you can have your future vision, but fundamentally, like connectivity itself, right? Improved, reliable connectivity and untethering has a lot of value. So you don't have to dream super big, but then once you get started, you'll see all of that opportunity. I think also you don't have to, like, so we have a millimeter away private network with tons of bandwidth, but you can start smaller. You can start mm -hmm. with, our Ericsson Private 5G product on unlicensed spectrum, get your you know proof of concepts done and, and start with like an MVP and then scale up. Like so with our Ericsson product, you can actually go to you know macro grade network products, full security and everything, but you can start small and simple and, and grow bigger. Right. So I think you know I think it don't don't intimidate yourself out of trying. Right? Dream big but it's all baby steps to get to that exactly. dream. So yeah. it's it's absolutely important that we are um, we have guts to innovate. That that we that we try things, that we evaluate them, and that we're constantly in that cycle. Yeah. Um, and so because we fail, will find the value. Like, yeah. You know, I flew drones around, and you know sometimes they don't work, and then you just pivot. So I think it's okay to embrace that as well. One thing I hear you say a lot, Carlos, is that the people matter a lot for this. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the technology, it's also about the people who use the technology. And it sounds like that's a really important thing to keep in mind. I had, a, I had an old mentor that once told me, if you want people to do cool things, you give them more than crayons. Um, and that's what these technologies are. It's, right. it's advanced cellular technologies. You need to give them the cloud, you need to give them, um, and then you need to challenge them. You need to, you need to constrain them so that they, that they innovate, um, and then cool things will happen. So as promised, I do want to turn to some of the questions in the chat. So one of our questions is, can you provide some information about the productivity and scalability benefits of smart manufacturing? Um, yes, yeah, so the, 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 the real-time aspect allows us to, to react faster to, to disturbances. Um, as, as many of you are aware, uh, manufacturing has a happy path through the production flow, and then there's a not happy path. And our ability to react to the not happy path is really what we're targeting. Um, these reliability benefits that we get from these cellular technologies are helping us react faster. And it, and it fundamentally, what we're talking about is we need more information about what's happening in real time out on the floor. We need to have high compute that allows us to process that information. And then we need to decide, and we need to turn in turn that into action that happens out on the floor, so that we can get back to the happy path as as quickly as possible. So, so when you start thinking in context of that, um, the benefits start to start to come out, right? You will start to find where your not happy paths are faster, and then your ability to react to them. You will start to understand what's happening faster, and then your ability to react to them. So, so this to us is is the benefits from a manufacturer and really any operations. The faster you can you can react, the better. Longer term, 
we're absolutely chasing this predicting. I don't even want to react. I want to fix the problem before it happens, which this is where it gets really cool. Now you're getting all of this information from the floor. You're starting to throw in simulation ability so you can do scenario planning around the variables that are hitting your manufacturing flow. Um, and you just ultimately end up making better decisions. Yeah, but I think that's why like scalability is important to consider, right? You don't want to start off with a technology. Let's mm -hmm. say, you know, you're using something on Wi-Fi, but if you're going to add hundreds of more of those same kind of sensors, you'll quickly run out of bandwidth, Absolutely. right? So you do want to think ahead a bit and, and make sure that you can accommodate the growth and new use cases that you're inevitably going to come up with. So we also have a question here about, can you elaborate on the 5G private network location detection use cases? I think this is talking about our AMRs. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Well, the AMRs locate themselves using the technology they've always had, which is using LIDAR and, and um, features of the environment to identify where they are. And that's actually why they can get lost if your maps aren't updated and you've reconfigured mm -hmm. part of your factory. Um, in 3GPP, which is the global standard for 5G, um, there are features coming that allow the cellular technologies, so the devices that are, you know, um, or the cellular modems in your devices will be able to identify where they are, and that'll give you additional benefits, right? So location is always important. Right now, cellular only supports location capabilities suitable for macro networks, like, you know, if your car runs off the road, they know where to find you, uh, but um, we don't have that capability capability yet. It's coming uh, mid-year for our European customers and uh, next year for US. So looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. So we also have a question here about the people and how people are, how are we keeping our people up to speed and training them and enabling them as we're implementing new technologies? Uh, we, we spend a, a lot of time uh, uh, I'll give a shout out to our hackathon planners and team. Mm -hmm. um, you have to give people the opportunity to, to tip their toes in technology um, in order to get comfortable with it. So part of this is uh, Ericsson as a company is very open to, in, to innovation and it is it's highly encouraged um, that we do this. So from the top, culturally, this is, this is who we are as, as Ericsson and, and it's awesome. Um, so that, that's part of it. Um, the other part of it is encouraging this, this curiosity with people um, and moving them past the, the, the old ways of working. Um, so we're constantly challenging ourselves. We're constantly pushing ourselves to how can we be, how can we be more efficient? Um, and we're very intentional and deliberate about these things. And when I'm talking about efficient, I'm talking about our, our, our path to productions and our, and our technologies that we're leveraging um, because this keeps people constantly innovating. Um, I have another mentor that taught me that uh, constraints breed innovation. So um, that's a technique that we use here, right? We, we constrain ourselves, we challenge ourselves, and then we see what outcome we can get. Um, added with a robust learning and development team that we have here at the factory where we focus on these topics um, creates this, this avalanche of, of curiosity and people just willing to try things. Um, Even the hiring process includes that, right? When we inter interview people, we look for their receptive, uh, receptiveness to technology. We don't actually demand that they have you know, advanced degrees or anything. It's just, are you cool with playing with new technology? And part of the onboarding is virtual reality to tour a factory to see you know, what's a day in the life look like. And it's really encouraging to see people that have very little technology background on the floor playing with technology and, and using it really well, it's its so super cool to see. Mm -hmm. So last week, I just to add a comment, I was talking with uh, some people on the shop floor and one of the employees that it's uh, hired uh, two weeks ago, he came to me and said, Daniela, this is amazing what we have here because we are so close to the technology that mm -hmm. when we are in the process, we cannot even imagine you know, this factor is like a lab for us. Yeah. So, you know, when you go and the, be close to the machines and have the opportunity, of course, you have the training. You cannot operate, you know, without the training. But as Carlos mentioned, we have a group here to support with the training. But then you go and, you know, experiment, you know, and have the opportunity to touch the technology. Yeah. That it's awesome. I, I, I heard this from, you know, one of our operators. It was amazing. 
to me, it's like a candy store because I can come in here and put on augmented reality. I can play with robots. There's so many toys for me, so it's it's really pretty awesome. And also, we are giving the opportunity for yeah. the people, you know, for them to be close to the technology. I think right. that it's very important when we bring this to the table because it's not a regular work. You yeah. know, when we say, ah, we are moving uh, materials, it's not only move from a place to another mm -hmm. one. We, in all aspects, we are adding technology. Yeah, and people are really creative, right? So they can say, okay, can I get the AMR to do something for me? And we say, sure. Like, what do you want, <laughs> right? Sure. <laughs> of course. So I'm seeing a few questions in the mm -hmm. chat about automation mm -hmm. and our automation strategy and how we make decisions about what to automate and what not to automate. Mm -hmm. So Carlos, can you weigh in on that? I know we've thought a lot about this topic. So so your 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 strategy and your your individual footprint at, at your at your factories uh, matter. Do you, what's your what's your volume mix? Um, what is the, the variances between product um, and what's the lifespan of your product cy uh, life cycles absolutely need, need to be taken into account. Um, we, we focus on economies at scale. What are, what are our production processes that can be applied to as many radios as possible? Um, and then we pursue those. Um, and then we, as I spoke earlier, we're, we're targeting the, the efficiencies. Um, we need to remain incredibly flexible in our environment, which means we need to be really quick about what we automate, and we need to be very deliberate about chasing. So, um, those are the thoughts that are going in our head, uh, is are going through our heads. Uh, we need to be uber flexible. We need to be quick to deploy the automation, and then look for economies of scale in in the automation. But I think you know we tackle things that are better done by machines and then we have to realize that sometimes pe people are amazing they can do things that are very difficult for yes. robots mm -hmm. so sometimes you know you got to look at that and say yeah that robot's not going to work let's let a person do it but then free up that person from doing more menial mm -hmm. work by using machines there right so i think it's really respecting that like humans are amazing and enable them with superpowers you know mm -hmm. by uh, automating other things superpowers um, <laughs> Oh yeah, five G is a superpower here. <laughs> but also, I think that we learn it during the journey. You know, we have an ambition. We had an ambition to be the fully automated factory, mm -hmm. and we learned it, that we needed to, for some process, it's not worth. Yeah. So then it's the reason that we decided, you know, to mix or add people or make, you know, the best mm -hmm. for the company. Exactly. So when we're talking about process uh we see some process that robots can not operate like Aren't us yeah. <laughs> so that is something that we learn it as well so another question we have here is about ar and vr and xr and i know we've experimented with that and had some learning so can you talk about what some of those learnings are yes so um AR and VR is an interesting topic in that the, the content creation really, really, really matters. Um, we've gotten to a point where the, the technology is, in a sense, made it, I don't want to say easy, my engineers will get mad at me, but it's, sure. it's quicker to, to, to develop some of these things. But we need to be incredibly focused on the context, uh, the content creation and the storytelling that comes with it in order to have a successful impl implementation. I, I wouldn't undermine that aspect. Um, moving beyond POCs, right? Uh, you can create 3D graphics, but then that gets stale really quickly. So then you have to ask yourself, what's the what's the story that we're that we're leveraging this AR VR for, um, in order to to get the most benefit? And this is specifically targeting the topic of these technologies being used in learning and development, um, uh, new higher orientation, right? You, you need to constantly be um, updating it. Um, the other aspect is on this on this remote assist um, type of scenarios, which I know a lot of manufacturers are are, are targeting. Um, I want to say one of the lessons we learned is when you're when you're looking at the, uh, the the headwear, make sure that it's comfortable for the operators. Some of, some of these are still a little bulky, um, so that's a lesson, right? P pick one that is comfortable and that people will be willing to wear. Um, additionally, some of them um, compress video. Um, and really don't have the optimization um, 
from a hardware perspective, the, the puzzle pieces are there to solve this. And we're starting to see this with this next generation of, of AR and VR technology, where they're coming now with uh, stabilization and they're coming with uh, 4K, 8K video quality, which then is then it can be leveraged from a remote assist perspective because it's comfortable for people to wear. So the, the, the people out on the floor are, are, are willing to use it. And then it and then helps them, right? When they get stuck on a problem, they have they have the help there at their fingertips in order to be able to do something. Yeah, you'll get better video quality, so it's less jittery. You know how yes. when a, a movie is too shaky, it's annoying. So you need that improvement. I think one of the things we're looking forward to is you know having 5G native headsets because then they can stream 4K, mm -hmm. whereas on Wi-Fi it's really choking up other uh, yes. Wi-Fi users. So and you're forced to compress, which then yeah. devalues exactly. the use case. Yeah. yeah. So we think that's where uh, 5G will actually make a huge improvement because you need that bandwidth. Sounds like you need to think about the user and you need to have good connectivity to make sure it's not jittery. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So we have another question here about um, how we're selecting our technologies that we're implementing in the factory. What are some of the things that we think are really important to consider when we're implementing a new technology? Well, security. So yeah. that's a that's a huge factor because we're a global company. We have to make sure uh, our supply chain and information is kept secure, right? But also integration. I think that's been one of the challenges. Yeah. Find find partners that are connected with your vision of what you want with the technology beyond the initial thing that you want from the technology. So. Um, if, uh, an example, right? I I I, I need a a tower to store stuff. Was it really just a tower to store stuff, or do I need to find my stuff quickly? Do I need to know where my stuff is at all times? Do I need to, um, do I have components that are sensitive to the environment? How am I gonna connect to those? How am I gonna secure them? How am I going to, um, so I think this is, this is one of these things we need to be very deliberate and upfront with what it is with, that we want um, beyond the thing that we want, if that makes any sense. Think further, think five, six, seven years ahead. You're gonna have to live with this thing and this partner for a long period of time. And those are the considerations that need to be taken into account when selecting these, these production technologies. Yeah, so vendors that are willing to innovate with you, but also system integrators. So it's not just a vendor and yourself, right? There's often many vendors involved. And so you really have to have that whole ecosystem of partners that think alike, right? Yes. That are willing to innovate with you. Integration is a big part of oh, yeah. the equation. Yeah. yeah. So I know we said our people need to be innovative and open to experimenting and trying new things. Sounds like your vendors need to have the same mindset. Absolutely. Yes. I'm trying to look for. So we also have a question here about the Industrial Internet of Things, or IIoT, and how the 5G rollout will impact that. So can you speak to that a little bit and also define what is the industrial internet of things for those who might not be familiar? Well, I mean, I think fundamentally anything that can generate data and, and needs to be connected will be connected and then connecting wirelessly as we've you know, enjoyed in our daily lives, right? Um, makes things a lot easier, right? Because everything can be mobile. So I think having the industrial internet of things be able to more easily connect lets you do things with greater agility, right? So you can mm -hmm. innovate more quickly and not go, okay, well, I have to schedule a cable drop and that'll take a week and you know a couple of thousand bucks. So I think um, we had a use case um, down on the SMA line where we added a sensor very quickly and, and could learn something about a process that we had a hypothesis about, right? So I think that kind of uh, agility, so the internet of things is just connecting anything you wanna connect more easily, right? That's part of industry for that is getting data. So, so where do we have, uh, I, I call them blind spots, or, or parts in our production flow where I don't have a machine that's intelligent, that's generating information. Um, and I, and I want to know more about what's happening there. And I want to know what's happening there in real time. And I want to take that information, combine it with a bunch of other information, and compute it, and make some assessment of, of what's happening on the floor. This connects back to what I was talking about earlier with the not happy path. Th this is what the, what the Internet of Things enables. Mm -hmm. Um, the, and, and the areas that this is happening is, is ever increasing. Projections show Internet of Things devices and manufacturers just ex increasing exponentially 
um, over the years, which then see, which then tells us that we need a, a backbone to handle um, all of these devices and connectivity. Another use is, uh, I talked earlier about the, the right partner and the right strategy and the right integrator. Uh, some of us have partners that maybe aren't so open to sharing the information as quickly as possible. That's another area where these uh, IIoT devices help us. We can, we can add IIoT devices and get the information that we need, um, sometimes a lot quicker. Um, so it, so it comes down to our efficiency um, in the development of the technologies, um, which kind of gets us down the path of why IIoT sensors and devices are so vital and important to, to a operational manufacturing type setting. Well, one thing we had to do early on was build a platform so that all of that data, so we talk about internet of things and everything's connected. They have to connect to something and the, the data has to go somewhere where it's usable and accessible. And so that's important. I think we don't want to underestimate that. You have to come up with a good platform, right? Our IoT mm -hmm. platform. And, and um, one other thought is people are things. I know we don't want to say it that way, but people are things. And so being able to connect them and get data from them while main, uh, respecting privacy is also important because they're such an important part of our factory. Right? So people's safety, people's productivity is important to somehow connect and use as data. And, and that's a fine balance of respecting their privacy while also helping with your industry for auto, like, you know, digital twins and big data. So to piggyback off of that, we have a question about how we're maybe vetting or testing technologies before we implement them on the line. And I know we've talked about proof of concepts as a something we've really experimented with. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Well, I think you know one of the first things is we we often have um, really cool ideas from people, and uh, within Carlos's team we bounce around. Um, you know, does it line up with our uh, OKRs, our objectives and key results? Does it contribute? Right? Can we see a path that it's actually a good idea that will scale? Um, but then, yeah, then we try to define an MVP, right, a minimum viable project, so that you you're it's kind of like following the agile process of development, right? You're saying show me that something works and then build on that and build on that. So um, I, I think that's been a helpful, you know, paradigm that we use. From a, from a people and culture perspective, I think it's important to have um, support of leadership, right? That is gonna allow you to, to try things. There is, there is a lot of value in failure. We've all heard, heard oh, yeah. those old adages. Um, and, and for me, it's the, the learning that you get is what needs to happen in order to, to, to innovate. So I highly, highly, yeah. highly encourage these, these proof of concepts. I highly, highly encourage that um, promoting a culture of, it's okay that we don't know, we don't need to have the answer for everything um, and we can mm -hmm. figure it out as we go along. What's important is, again, back to the people, a harp on people all day, because nothing happens without the people that we have here, the smart people. Um, they need to feel safe. They need to feel like they can that they can do this. And and the value yeah. is the learning. They can innovate and fail, and that's totally okay. Yeah, you're gonna learn from that. Just to add a comment here, it's very important here. What we are doing is that we go to the shop floor, we go mm -hmm. to the warehouse, and we are collecting, you know, the, the ideas that they are provide to us. So Absolutely. again, it's people. Yeah. You know, people. Sometimes uh, when we talk about innovation or we talk Indus 4.0 robots, people start make you know people start uh, scared about this word because what is gonna happen with me? But it, this is not the reality. We need mm -hmm. people to yeah. bring you know the ideas for us to automate, for us to innovate. So mm -hmm. this is the culture that we are provide or we are building here. Yeah, I like to think of like we're not replacing people. We're no. enabling them. So like. You know, Iron Man, such a cool character in, in Marvel. We're equipping people to be like Iron Man. Imagine the uh, uh, augmented reality that he has, right, and the robotics. So if everyone could be equipped like Iron Man, we'd be like superheroes making radios like crazy. Yeah. Tony Stark is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. So we've talked about 5G and the benefits of 5G, and now we have a question here about how would you go about getting licensed or unlicensed spectrum. Can you speak to that a little bit, Paul? I think, you, yeah, you kind of have to look ahead at what your requirements are, and you're going to guess wrong. But you've got to start somewhere and say, well, you know, 
what, what do I make? How many machines do I currently have? And how many of those machines can be untethered? Right? Um, but then you can start small. Like I was describing earlier, we have a, um, a product, uh, Ericsson Private 5G, that is set up to be very similar to Wi-Fi. It uses unlicensed spectrum, uses radio dots that you can connect very easily so your uh, electricians know how to connect it up and install it. Um, and then you can start from there. And as you expand, that, that you know, what we call EP5G product can grow and you can add new spectrum. You can add licensed spectrum like millimeter wave. So once you have hundreds of devices, you can grow and, and it doesn't constrain you. So I would start small, do some POCs, right, proof of concepts, uh, and then expand into it, right? But if you have a large factory that you have to connect, the basic connectivity, start there because you already know what you need, right? So you're not guessing as much. But I think working with vendors that have products that can scale is important. You don't want to start off small and then go, oh, I have to rip that out, right, and, and lose that investment. I think being able to scale it is, is important. So work with partners that can work with you. And we will also have a survey after this. So if you do want more information about that, please answer the survey and we can reach out to you. But building on that answer, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. do want to ask, I've heard you talk a lot about prioritizing use cases when you're implementing 5G. Can you elaborate about that a little bit? Prioritizing like, use cases. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like prioritizing automation, right? You look at where you have problems, where you can offload people, where you need data. Um, you know, as, like, I think we don't sit around and try to invent problems. Like, I think we look at, okay, how do we improve our operations, right? We already have a lot of data. Where are we missing information to mm -hmm. confirm a hypothesis? So I would prioritize that. But, like, for example, most of the customers I've talked to that have toured our factory, um, autonomous mobile robots. It's almost like, you know, the, the no-brainer, you got to do this because that's huge efficiencies right there, right? Material movement, safety, quality. And they benefit a lot from uh, 5G connectivity because they're moving. It's like your car, right? Connecting your car has shown you great benefits being, you know, able to use Google, Google Maps to get to the airport. Well, the AMRs have the same benefit of knowing, hey, there's an obstruction there, I should take a different path. And I think 5G is a no-brainer there, for sure. I think it's it's a combination of the um, one of, one of the fun things of working in, in manufacturing and operations is the the problems change often, and, and, and our operations people are, are constantly um, I'm trying to, to react. So having a, a very clear understanding of what problem it is that we're trying to solve. Um, is is very very important, um, and, and a lot of us. I mean, this is this is normal prioritization. But I think in addition to that, um, you need to think from a from a this is from the business side. But you also need to think from a from the technology side. What what are the things that that uh, as a technology expert I would I would like to see? Um, well, something that I would like to see is um, I want our automation to to fix and diagnose itself. And I want it to, to get to that point. So if I break down just that statement, how do I get mm -hmm. a, a piece of automation to fix, diagnose itself? Um, really what I'm talking about is its ability to predict that a not happy path thing is going to happen. And it already knows what to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so now let's turn that around and go from a technology perspective. What, what do I need in order to do that? Do I need this? Now you start talking your your SCADA concepts and your, your where do I have the, the control of the robot? What is the connectivity that I'm using for the control of the robot? Um, is my cloud uh, too far away or do I need to have it on-prem, right? Because I need to be super, super fast in, in this because how do I get machine learning on top of it? So I think the answer is in both, right? Uh, we, we absolutely need to be chasing the, the today problems, but we absolutely need to be chasing the five year from now problems. And sometimes this means flipping it and going from a technology perspective. What are, what are these things that I need to connect? How do I get the, the, the IIoT sensors, the cloud, the machine learning, AI, the edge, the, all, these tech, all these buzzwords into one solution that gets us to a place where our manufacturing flow is um, predicting, fixing itself, diagnosing itself, um, and, and ultimately 
being beyond efficient. It gets us out of reactive to predictive and prescriptive. Yep, yep, I think so. But I think what what's fortunate about how we've started is we've built a platform like uh, with our data and our cloud services and our on-prem compute that allows us to do that pretty quickly. So I think building that up carefully with good architecture has helped us be able to adapt to these use cases as they come up. And it's easier for us to experiment quickly. So. All right, thank you so much for that really great answer. I'm not seeing a lot of other questions in the chat. So Carlos, could you leave us with some closing thoughts? Perhaps what should be a big takeaway from this? <laughs> it's transformative. It's a journey. Um, be flexible. Be open and able to yeah. fail early, and early and as often as possible. Um, get your leadership involved with this philosophy. Um, the most important part of a transformation is the culture and the people around you. Um, and you need to be very deliberate and intentional and, and relentless in your strategies around what you're doing for for the people, um, the technology is an enabler. It's the it's the people that use the technology to do it. So, um, please prioritize that. It, it will it will it will solve your problems. And imagine possible. Imagine yes. possible. That's our phrase. Yes. So thank you so much for tuning in today. We are so glad you're able to join us here at Ericsson's USA 5G Smart Factory. There will be a survey after this webinar, so please take time to complete that, and we look forward to hearing from you later. Thank you.